I'm going to start out a little light here and, and just show some of the, the views that you get to make with the tool. Um, and then we'll we'll more formally start in about five minutes because we're still going to have people trickling in, I have no doubt. Um, so to begin with, thanks everyone for joining um, Abby and I for this this uh, workshop we're doing for you. Um, we're we're hopefully recording this, and so we'll have this up afterwards for you to look at too. Um, the the URL for the site itself is viewshare v i e w s h a r e dot org, um, and I should start out by noting that we have um, we have this great little screencast video here that you can watch um, and we have some excellent getting started materials uh, these three links up at the top here learning how to import collection data generating views embedding and sharing collection data all cover basically everything we're going to work through today with some nice big images so don't necessarily feel like you need to um, sort of mem memorize everything or, or figure everything out in this uh, conversation here in this sort of demo that we're doing more focus on the, the broad picture and um, also feel free to ask questions as you're going to, to sort of post them in the chat make sure you send them to everybody and uh, by default they just sort of go to Abby um, as opposed to going to to both of us here um, so make sure that you um, so just to kind of let it, let this whole experience uh, wash over you, get a sense of what it can do, and then you'll probably be in a great position once we're done to um, be able to go out and, and use this and at least know sort of how this would work and how you might use it with some of your information. So I'm going to start by showing uh, a few different examples of what the end product is here. So just off of the home page so you can um, check this out yourself as well. We have a link to one view, uh, and this is actually a, a collection of trade cards um, from Brooklyn, New York. And you can see here that we've got this sort of big interface that, that we've built. There's a map. Um, I can switch and see everything on a pie chart. I can switch and see a list view. And in each of these cases, this is uh, information from the collection, the records of, of a collection. And, here we can actually see what one of these trade cards looks like. So this is uh, one of the trade cards, and here's another one. And then we have the 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 detailed information, the sort of metadata of the collection there as well. And I'll go back to the map view. So we have these central views that we've created based off of data. In this case, this was created from uh, a spreadsheet, but it works with a few other ways of entering data as well. And then on the side here, we've got a few facets. So, for example, we can look at the confectioner's business type. Uh, again, just a category that was in the original data. I can zoom in and see where the confectioners are on the map, browse their cards, and those persist as I move through the other side. So the pie chart of confectioner's business types isn't particularly interesting, but the subjects is. So they're using children, flowers, women, um, birds. Those are the, sort of the categorized pieces of information. But the idea here is that as we move through each of these different views in the in the center here, we're seeing the the same results from clicking on the the facets. So again, if we get look at department stores and switch to subjects, we're now seeing the subjects of the department stores or the confectioners or uh, you know the other subjects associated with animals or the business types that have animals. Um, on their cards. And this is all original, this is sort of the data that was cataloged with these items um, to begin with. So here again, another trade card. So that's a quick tour of one view. I'll, I'll pull up another one and then um, two more and then we'll sort of get into the, the whole process here and we'll give you a little more background on this and walk through exactly how you build these views. So another one that we have linked off the home page is uh, uh, a view created by some folks at um, Old Dominion University. And this view has, let's see here, we have, uh, it's more of a view of collections. So instead of individual items, each of these is actually a collection. And we can link out to the page where that collection information is. Um, so that there are actually 
URLs in here. That's not a lot to display on a map, but if we put it into the list view, we'll see in here uh, the actual information about the uh, the collections. The same sort of faceting here, and the the timelines work the same. So we're now getting information about these different collections associated with desegregation um, in Virginia education. And this was again created from a, a spreadsheet of information, and so we'll give you a tour of, of how that works. Um, before we go any further, I'm just going to pull up and make sure that we're good to go. Yeah, and so if everyone uh, saw if folks are having trouble with audio, try having the system call your phone. And um, uh, she's also uh, mentioning that uh, you can chat her if you're if you're having trouble. Um, great. So I'll I'll show another view or two, and then Abby will actually join us on the phone too, so that she can tell me if if things are looking confusing, it's sort of tricky to see what you're showing and, and show at the same time, so it's really helpful to have someone else in here too. So here is, this is actually a collection that was created, or a view that was created from um, from a really neat project. This is uh, Driving Through Time, um, the Digital Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, and so in this case they've put together this really nice collection uh, website, and once I heard that the the folks, and you can see all of their affiliations down at the bottom, once I heard that these folks had put together this really neat view, I thought it would be uh, fun to try working with their data, and so they actually had a, an XML uh, dump of the whole set of info through an Atom feed, um, which you don't need to know the details of that. It was just one way to get the data out, and then I was able to import it in one fell swoop, and so we have you know, 3,072 items, in this case they were uh, geolocated as well, so we can see them here um, on a timeline in a list view. And it's a lot of items to make a list for, so it's taking itself a moment. Um, but one of the neatest things we've we, I've got a couple of uh, different facets from the ones I've already showed everyone. So we'll switch back to the map. Great, thanks, Abby. <laughs> um, glad to know that that you're you're on the call there too. Um, so, again, just going to show a little bit more with this view, and then I'll sort of start from scratch with a spreadsheet and 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 make a view uh, that we can all watch the process on. So, to begin with, with this view, one of the things that's really nice is we have these. Uh, we actually have this histogram, uh, which is just a chart showing over time the different. Uh, frequency of the years in this case. So if you have numerical data in your data set, you can actually then go in and say, okay, we want only everything from 1939 till uh, 1957, and we'll see that the map shifts accordingly, or I could switch to a later section um, and view only those items, or if we zoom all the way back out, You'll also see each of these facets change as we click on different chunks. So if we, for example, switch to just show that section of years, we'll actually see in the histogram that it's shifted to show only those. Or if we want to see where the, uh, for example, the letters are all sort of clumped in one section of years here, um, and we can see them on the map. And there's a whole bunch of them, all 118 of them, located in one spot over there. So in this case, it actually becomes a pretty neat way for us to explore and see patterns that emerge in the data that wouldn't necessarily be obvious if we were looking through them one record at a time. Um, so I'll go back to the start, and it's 1.10, so, so it's probably a good time for us to start uh, working our way through building a view. Um, but before I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll just... Uh, briefly pause and, and we can see if there are any questions that have come up just from showing a few of the different views. Um, 
So I'll pull up the chat. And if you just want to put questions out to everybody and, and not just send them all to Abby, that'd be great. Great. So to begin with, we have, um, I'll give a little background on, on who we are and what we're doing. So uh, ViewShare is a tool that uh, we're providing um, from the Library of Congress. Abby and I work with um, NDIP, uh, the sort of part of the library focused on, on digital preservation. And we've developed this tool that we're making much more uh, initially for partners that we work with in digital preservation, but we're now, we've sort of got it opened up to a much larger larger cultural heritage community who might be interested in using the tool. So uh, we we talk about having three key functions and they're sort of explained in the boxes at the bottom here, importing collections, generating views, and then embedding and sharing the views. And so under each of these is also linked to, so uh, from, from the little boxes at the bottom. So if you want a tour of the functionality, import collections explains how you can import data, generating views describes the process through which you build the the actual interfaces to those that collection information, and um, embed and share explains how ultimately you get a public URL that you can send to anyone, and then you have the ability to embed that directly into your own website. So in the same way that you would embed a YouTube video or any number of other sort of little embeddable pieces of content in your own site, you do the same thing with these interfaces. So to, to give a sense of that, I was showing you that trade cards view a few minutes ago, and I think up here I actually have a image of that embedded in another site. So here is actually a different website, and we've embedded the trade cards view, and you can see it's taken on the local styling, but the maps still function. It's not just a picture, it's actually the view itself. And there's the pie chart, etc. So jumping back to the home page, so in the end, you get to embed and share the views that you make. So you import data, build views, embed and share. It's important to upfront stress that this isn't a place that holds your actual content. So in the case of showing those images, it's just um, display as sort of telling. Uh, it knows where the picture lives on your own website or in your own wherever you've stored the images online, and it just wraps a wraps a tag around them. I think we just we gotta mute somebody. Okay, we're back. Okay. Um, okay, so to begin with here, I will um, upload a data set. And in this case, I'm just going to use a very simple set of postcards or set of information about postcards. So here I have just a spreadsheet that has the names of postcards, cities and states in plain text, related dates, um, years in this case. The description field here has a bunch of uh, has a couple of sentences about each of these postcards. Then I have a category field which has a sort of short little set of categories that I've devised to use with this. So uh, recreation, transportation, etc. And then you'll notice that in some cases, some of these cards have multiple categories, which will be relevant later. Then there's actually just a link to where the image file itself is, and uh, a bit more information um, that we can work with from there too. So that's the spreadsheet I'm going to use, and ultimately we're going to build a view that looks like this. So this is um, that same set of information, those categories, like famous residences, etc., um, pinned on a map put in a list, put on a timeline, visible in charts. Um, so we're going to go from spreadsheet to this in uh, the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and if if there are any other problems like that, just Abby jump in and um, tell me or anything, and I'll, I'll slow down or repeat things. And, and we'll have plenty of time for questions in here too. So uh, let's get back to the home page here. So from the the home page once you have an account. Um, if you don't have an account already, you'll need to just send an email. There's info about that on request a free a request free account. But if I go to data, I can then um, click upload data. And then you'll see four different options here. Um, there's simple spreadsheets, which is what we're going to be using for this. There's XML mods files. Um, so these are uh, uh, 
you know, a structured data format. If you're familiar with it, that's great. Then you can use it with your data. If you're unfamiliar, you probably don't have that data anyway. Um, but then we have, we also work with um, the Open Archives Initiative's um, uh, endpoints. So they're, they're, uh, there are methods for exchanging data. We work with those as well. And so if you have um, a system that's set up with that, you can use that. And then we also have some very limited ways of working with a, a few versions of Content DM, but they're, they're, they're somewhat experimental, so they're probably not ready for prime time for most people. So we'll start by uploading data. And again, I, I just click the Data tab. clicked upload data, and then uh, chose to go from a file on my computer. So let's see here. I've got a Fairfax postcards document right on my desktop, and I will open that up and upload it. And it'll think about it for a minute. If you have a lot more data, it'll take longer. Um, this is probably a good point to mention the sort of uh, limitations of this. If you have um, from spreadsheets, we've seen collections work fine with an upwards of uh, 5,000 records, but the, it gets slower the more records you have. And it's also, it's not a hard limit, it's a bit fuzzy because it has to do with how much information you actually have in any given view. So if you had, you know, a hundred fields of data about each item, you'd get a lot less um, number of items that would be visible. So I've uploaded my spreadsheet, and you can see here that it's taken the names of those fields, things like the, the categories and the name of the postcards, the image URLs, and it set those, and then it's actually allowing me to browse through all of the 22 records it identified. Now beyond that, I can go in and now say that this URL, the image URL, is actually an image, and it will wrap it in an image tag, and it'll do that for each of these as well. So now we're starting to sort of add value and describe the information that we've uploaded. I can, for example, say that um, I had l points of latitude in there, so I can define those. Um, I'll want to note, if, note that the years there are actually numerical information, so I'm going to set those up. That'll let me use them in that histogram path that I was showing earlier. So there's a, a series of the, the facets that only work with numeric type information. Um, I can actually get rid of a few of these fields that, that might not be relevant, so I'm, I'm dropping the card number, I'll also drop other images. Those were relevant in another context, but aren't particularly relevant in this case. So now we've got a basic uh, set of information in, in the record here, which is great. But we can actually do another thing at this stage, which is pretty exciting. And so we can add fields. This little green button that says Add allows you to add new fields and use existing fields to generate the information for them. So for example, if I didn't have those points of latitude there, I could make a uh, I could derive them from just the plain text place name. So I'll make a new field called lat long 2 and I'll say that it's for a map and then I'll just choose to use the city and state field and say create. So again I named the field, I chose that I was doing it for a map so it knows which kind of um, which service to use to look up in this case the names of those places. And then from there I can go in and say create and then it'll remind me that I should augment this um, so I'll, I'll hit the augment button and it'll tell me success all my fields were successfully augmented and you can see that it's it's derived points of latitude and longitude for each of those um, in this case slightly more specific than some of the other ones that were in there um, but what's neat in this case is, is we can actually get the ability to map these items that didn't have that uh, lat long information based on some plain text information. Um, you know, just that these are from Great Falls, Virginia. Um, so that's one augmentation. I'll show you the other two very quickly. So um, to put things on a timeline, it's best to have um, the international standardized date. So I'll call this ISO date and say so that I'm going to make a timeline and then I'll choose related date and say create and then I'll click augment again and now it's just in this case there were years so it's just going to assume that, assume that they were the very first day of each of those years but you can see that it's got the the signature sort of ISO structured date format which will be very useful for building our 
um, timeline in a bit. And then the last one I'll add is a list. So we'll make a, a new data field called themes. And I'll choose list and we'll take that category information that we had. Um, and in this case, I'll add in the pattern that we're using to break those apart. So you can imagine a lot of instances where you have sort of a series of, of pieces of information in one um, field, like I had some of the cards were transportation and military history and they were separated by commas. So if I use this one that'll separate them by commas and these are a few other sort of basic ways to break things apart. But we use commas so we'll say create and augment. Okay, and it worked for all of them. It sort of gives you a notification about how successful those augmentations were, the, the adding of new data. And we can see that in each of these cases, we've got 22 values for each of them, which is, is great, because that's how many items we have. So the next step here is to save it. And we'll give our data set a title. So this will be Fairfax Postcards. And then if I had a description, I could add it. And then I can choose to keep it, to make it public or private. If I make it private, only I will see it when I'm logged in. If I leave it public, anyone can see it. Um, and then uh, the, you have the same ability to set public and private with views too. But uh, if you want other people to see it, it's probably a good idea to make it public. Um, okay, so I've made that public. And now from there, the next step is to build my view. Um, and so I'll just jump straight into building the view and then uh, we can go to more questions after that. Um, so I'll just I'll work straight through that part and then we'll have some time for questions. So I'll start with a two column or well I guess I should step back again. So once you've built your once you've uploaded your data set and sort of added that little context information to, to make it useful you then go and click the build link there, which will show up on any of the data sets. Um, so once you've clicked build, you'll see that there are several different layouts, um, and these will make sense when, um, based on our earlier experience seeing how the, the there's a central view and then a set of facets. And so if you want to use a lot of facets and have just a little space for the view in the middle, you might use the three columns layout. I generally end up going with the, the two column layouts. You can also have them show up on top. Uh, but we'll go with two columns. And then from there you'll see this interface and down here at the bottom we have the ability to show which of the fields we want to see and then up here we sort of set a bunch of uh, individual preferences for which how to show them so just to give a sense of how this works I'll toggle back and forth so there's a show preview tab there and if you you click on that you'll move back and forth so if I click on the preview here's what so far my view looks like it's not it's not particularly fancy yet um, but we'll get there but you can already see that we've got something uh, we're on our way so that's my view as it is right now um, and we've got the list to start with but I will add a few more views so up here at the top you can add more views We'll start with a map, but as you can see here, there's a whole range of different things. We can have galleries of images, we can have pie charts, timelines, lists. If you have multiple pieces of numerical data, the scatter plots are actually really interesting ways to display information. And then tables. Um, I'll start with adding a map. And then here it's it's assuming to use lat long as the field, but you can see we could also use lat long too, that field I augmented. And then it's going to ask us what color we want to set or what we want to control the color of the pins. So in this case, I'll set that to um, themes, which was that, that field I, I broke apart. And then what I want to set the the specific settings for beyond that. We'll make sure that the names show up as the titles. And now if we click on preview and then click on the map, we'll see that we've got them all mapped right there. And so in this case, uh, we've got probably too much data showing up there. There's just too much to show in that part. So I'll switch back to the builder and then I'll go in and turn off some of these fields that I don't want to show on the map. So we've already got the name because it's showing up as the title. We'll leave the date in maybe the themes. There's probably actually not enough space for a description. So I'm taking out most of these fields. Um, and then we'll go back to the preview. Click on map. And now when we click on one of the pins, we're just getting the image and the related date. 
so that's pretty nice. And I'll switch back. I'll add a few more views. We'll add the timeline. In this case, uh, a whole bunch of little f features you can set there. We'll set the color key again to use the theme, so that'll be consistent. It's already decided to start with the date that we had marked as an ISO date. And then we'll make sure it's using the name for a title. Maybe we want the timeline to come first. We just drag it over. And there we are. We've got our timeline. And then we've still got our list and our map. So we'll go back. In this case, I'll go into my list and make sure that I set the title for this. So we'll use the names for the title. Um, I'll probably turn off a couple of these. Go back and show the, the actual site there. I see a question, which map engine is it using? We're using um, Open Layers, um, an open street map, so that's what we're using. And GeoNames is actually the service we use to look up the, the data there. Oh, Navi's got the answer there too. So, um, so that's a quick view of the timeline and the map. Um, I'll actually add in a, a chart to um, and in this case, the only field I really wanted for that is themes, because a lot of these other things wouldn't really make good charts, since they're all individually unique things. Um, and I'll also add a gallery view, and so it's just going to take the image URL, and then I can set how I want them to sort and what I want the title to be. So we'll use the names again, and maybe we'll put the gallery first. So now we've got the gallery, the timeline, the list, the map, and the pie chart. Um, but now I'll add in widgets. So that was views in the in the center there, and then the widgets are, are sort of the, the facets that you use on the side. So here are all our types of facets. We've got a search box, um, a list view, a tag cloud, a, a slider that works sort of as creates histograms, um, a range uh, range thing there, which is basically the same as the list, but for numbers. And you can also just add logos or freeform text if you have text you want to put on the side of your view. So I'll start with a search box, and we can choose to name it something different if we want. I'll just go with search. I'll also add a, um, let's go with a slider for years. So it's actually previewing what the year slider is going to look like there. So that's actually the distribution of the years associated with my postcards. So that's nice. Then I'll add a a list, and we can actually see what the list would look like with different things. It's not nearly as nice. The, the city and state one just has so many different values, so many ones in it. But when we look at themes, we've actually got this pretty clearly broken down. So I'll add that set of themes. And then uh, with the range, what's really nice is when you when you try out the, the dates here, you can actually set them to different intervals. So if I move this up to... Um, you know, if we move it all the way out to 800 years, it's not particularly useful. If it's set down at three, they're all in individual categories. But when we go out to something like 50, uh, we end up seeing a pretty nice spread of these uh, in there. So I'll switch back to preview, and you can see these here. Um, now, the I think I saw a question about switch, switching the size of them. That's actually configurable um, on the end user side, so you can you can switch those bigger or smaller. But one of the things that's really neat here too is, as you go in, if you go down to famous residences, now we're only seeing the histogram for those dates. If I go into 1900 to 1950, we're we're seeing all of the other parts of this shift dynamically around that. So you you can actually put things in that have way too many categories. You know, there might even be a hundred different things inside, a hundred different values in one of these facets. But once you've clicked on something, it'll sort of pivot you into something really useful for, for sort of understanding them. And again, now we're only seeing in the center here the 1750 to 1800 postcards. Um, now we're only seeing the 1750 to 1800 famous residence postcards. Um, and the same across the timeline, the list, the map, and the pie chart. Um, so if we turn off famous residences, that'll become a little more useful again. So then uh, I will save this quick, and I'll show everyone how that works. So you just say save again. This will be Fairfax Postcards. Um, so this is a view I created for the workshop. 
save that and we'll leave it public and then we actually get this page here so now anybody can actually go to this if you want viewshare.org slash views slash trow that's my username slash fairfax dash postcards dash two and that will get you to the publicly available interface to this and you can do everything I was doing inside there we can you know pass it down to those four items we can keep it all the way wide out to there um, work through each of these different views etc and then as I mentioned you can embed them just by clicking that embed link and copying and pasting that into uh, you know, if you're using WordPress or anywhere that you can put HTML, you can just sort of paste that in and you'll get the whole interface that you just built right there. Oh, and Abby shared it in the chat. So that's a, a quick run through of the general functionality here, um, sort of soup to nuts, uh, uploading your data and, and working through it. Um, it's probably a good opportunity for us to pause for questions. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So if you go into, um, I went back into edit there, um, and then went to, and we'll see if this is the question. So on the timeline, you can set the bands that it defaults to, sort of the 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 bands that you're working with, and the date that you want to use. Um, so if you had multiple dates, you could. For instance, actually have multiple timelines if you had different dates that you wanted to use. Um, and so if we went in and said that we want the top band to be decade and the bottom band to be century, we can do that. And then the timeline will use those uh, bands instead. Is that what the question was or was do you think the question was different, Abby? Oh, okay. Yeah, they are all clumped together. <laughs> um, so to show that, if you end up with with multiple things on the same date, they'll just sort of stack up uh, in a in a row. Um, in this case, I don't have any that are right on top of each other in terms of years, but you'd see that in other views. If they if they all assigned the same date, you would see them. Um, well, they wouldn't sort of stack on top of each other. Right, and it might. And I'll pull up this Dove data set to show what happens when you have that. This one, if you have a start and an end date, you'll get spans for them. Um, so in this case, uh, it gets a little unwieldy sometimes, but you get the sense of it. Um, uh, you know, these two have the same start date, and they just show up as separate lines on the on the view there. But they're um, they're still consistent. Okay, I'll go back to my postcard view um, that I made there. Great. That's a great question. So in this case, um, the lookup service that we're using will come up with a point for, I mean, it'll come up with a point for a country. So if you, if you had, um, if you did have France, it would stick a pin in the middle of France. And that would, at the sort of global scale, still be pretty useful to see where these things fall. It's not really going to have that level of specificity, but it at least gives you a sense of where things are. Um, and then we've got another question. Must you have a value? Can you have blanks? Uh, yeah, you can have blanks. That doesn't bother the system. Um, exactly as Abby said, it'll just uh, it'll just show up as as missing. Or in so yeah, if you have empties, they'll show up as missing in say the theme section over here. And I would see a number. Maybe there would be ten of them that had missing values or no values, and I could click on that and see all the ones that didn't have a value associated with them. Um, yeah, the image reference links question. So the um, 
it needs a URL to work from. So something presumably that's going to end in .jpg, .ping, something like that. Because it's just going to wrap that URL in an image tag to display it. So um, as long as you can generate a URL um, that, would, that you could wrap, that would work. Okay, great. There was a question there about how users work, um, levels of permission, and that sort of stuff. Uh, great question. It's a very simple system. You you create, you get an account, and then you can sort of do everything we just showed you. There aren't sort of different roles necessarily. Um, so if your, um, you know, every user in here basically has the same set of roles, and they can work with their own data. Um, upload data, create views. If you did want to use it for teaching, we'd be we're 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 up for creating accounts for students. So if you wanted to request to get um, or have your students request accounts, they could, and then they can just go through this whole process. Um, now beyond that, you you do get the ability to work together to figure out how you want to do these things based on say what permission. If you had everyone entering data into a spreadsheet, say together, maybe it's a use a Google spreadsheet or any number of other online spreadsheet tools to say put together the information, and then you know you upload that, and then people can build views based on it. Um, Great. Can multiple people work on the same view? Uh, what you can do, so if you go to viewshare.org slash, um, well, let's just go to my page. So if you go to, I think this should be my page. So from viewshare.org profile slash profile slash trial, that's my, my profile, you can actually come in and see um, all of the data sets that I've uploaded. So in this case, I've actually got a few different data sets here. And any of you, if you have accounts, you have the ability to build off of my data sets too. So, for example, one person could upload a data set and then 15 people could create different interfaces to that data set if you wanted. Um, now, beyond, aside from that, you can't actually have multiple people editing the same view. It's a sort of one-to-one -one thing between users and views. But um, I can create views of your data and you can create views of my data. That is as long as it's public. Um, I should mention that um, if you if you haven't made your your view public, you can still share it with people. So I'll switch to views here quick. And um, so, for example, if I wanted to with uh, with that postcards view I just made, if I go into um, well, actually, I need to. There, every view and every data set also has an inspect page. Um, and on the inspect page, you can see what data set it used. Or if you're on a data set, you'll see all the views that were created off of that data set, um, all the users who have worked with that data set. Now, if you go to edit here, you can actually change it to be private. And if it's private, then only I can see it by default. But I can actually um, create. Uh, I can share it with other people, and so if I give this a label, say, um, uh, maybe I just want to share this with everybody in the workshop, so I'm going to save that, and then it generates this custom URL that I can share with people, so oh, it'll only be accessible to people who have this link, as opposed to being a public website, it's actually got a key in it, and so I'll jump in chat and share the link. And so that's now where anyone can go to see the view that I created, um, but privately. Yes, uh, the, there was a question if we'd make accounts for projects as opposed to um, individuals, um, potentially as a workaround for multiple editors. We'd be thrilled to make accounts for projects. We'd actually, in general, prefer to not have accounts associated with individual people, but associated with organizations or, or some sort of entity. Just it, it's we'd, we'd prefer not to have any kind of necessarily sort of personal information about people, so the less, uh, the better in that case. And then you could yourselves figure out how to how people within the group would share the account. Okay, more extensive text. So is ViewShare designed to accommodate more extensive text associated with various images? Um, could you give a little more info on that? Are you asking about sort of like, say, full text information or um, uh, anything like that? Is there... Oh, wait a second, and then I'll answer. Just... Yeah, okay, so, so more or less full text. 
um, you'll run into problems in that case uh, depending on how much text is associated with these. You'll start to run into potential problems with, say, if you had, you know, 8,000 words for every object. Um, you'd run into some performance issues quicker, than, so you probably couldn't have 5,000 objects with 8,000 words associated with them. But it um, it should work pretty pretty well uh, with with uh, smaller numbers. Um, so I'd encourage you to try it out and, and see where it gets you. Uh, what it would do, you, I mean, the, that kind of stuff would work great, for example, in the list view. Um, and even if you didn't display it, uh, the search box would search through all of the, the text that was there. So it, the, that would be a way to um, help people search through potentially the full text of materials. Um, and so if you had, say, a... Oh, great question. So, is there support for audio files? Um, and this is this is something I probably should have mentioned earlier too. That the one of the neatest ways that this ends up working is that, um, like, I'll pull up that view I just had. So there isn't there isn't direct support for say playing audio files. Like we don't have a way to wrap um, a URL and, and and sort of display it as an audio file uh, or like a player or something like that. But for example, in this Blue Ridge data set, when you find an item that's interesting, you know, it's got the link to the page there, and then you could imagine that if this was a video or an audio file, um, once I got out to the actual page where the the uh, you know the object in any number of places that that URL could link me to, I might have a player here or something like that. So we've used this internally in a few examples where we would say um, maybe we have sort of records for a bunch of um, uh, interesting audio objects and then or or video objects and we'll sort of create the view as sort of a layer that lives on top of it and then uh, leave the URLs as the link so if you want to then go listen to it or play it or do whatever else you would do with it you just jump out to where it lives on the web and then uh, go from there but with that said if you did leave them Christine I missed it no Okay, great. So, can you update data that you've already uploaded? Okay, yeah, the collection's grown, you've added new items. Great question. Um, and you can. I should use this as a moment to clear, to make sure everyone's on the same page. You can't, there's no way to edit data through ViewShare itself. It, it, um, it's strictly a sort of display and, um, and obviously can augment data as I was showing you. But if we go back to my postcards, data set. So we'll actually go back to the data set. And then as I mentioned, there's an inspect page for each data set and for each um, view. If you go into the inspect page there, there's a little link that says refresh. And that will tell me that I can choose a file to replace the data. So if we go with the Fairfax postcard set again and say open, and then I can say upload. I haven't actually edited the data, so it's not going to be particularly different, but you'll see that it just basically refreshes all the data in the field. I need to rerun these augmentations down here, so I say augment again, and then immediately after that, it's all that data will be available in the view. So if I had, for example, gone in and added two rows to the bottom of that, or you know, if there had been five more um, uh, records, it, I would just edit the original file, add those in, and then hit refresh, re-augment the data, and we're good to go. It'll it'll actually perpetuate out to any views that I'd built of that uh, data set. Yeah, I'll pull up both of those.
right? Um, we, we we had one with five thousand. One of the one of the um, election ones. We had five thousand things in. That's where it starts to push the limit. No, we don't. Um, and it'll it it's it's the, I guess the the thing to note there is that it's um it it all runs in your browser. It's actually loading the data in your browser for the whole set of information. So it's sort of it, your mileage will vary when you get bigger and bigger collections based on um you know how much uh, what people's browsers are and things like that too. But we we've, we've successfully had as many as five thousand records in a view. And one of the things we're interested in pursuing in the future is scaling that higher. But that's going to sort of depend on user interest. So I've got a couple of questions here that I wanted to note. So that was that question. Um, there was a question about code to embed a view. And I'll show that. Then there was um, a question about uh, what browsers and browser versions work with this directly um, and browser support. So, okay. So I'll answer the first one. The First I'll mention where you go to embed the view. Um, so from any view that you're working with, there will be uh, up in this set of links at the top here, we've got edit, inspect, share, there's embed. And that pops up this little blue box and that'll have script ID and it gives a little bit of info. And then it's basically the one line that you copy and paste into somewhere where you can enter um, HTML. Uh, and, and so you paste that in the same way you would a YouTube view or, or a YouTube embed sort of thing. Um, so again, you just copy that script, put it into, you know, whatever whatever tool you use to edit your HTML, and it'll add the view just as we have shown here, where you sort of seamlessly is using ViewShare to power the view, or in this case, you know, this one with the maps. Um, so that was one question. The next one was browser support. Um, on the site, we have a rundown of some browser info, I think under... I should remind everyone again we have a we have three quick pages import generate embeds so those are the sort of quick guides and there's also a really extensive user guide here um, that as you can see from the size of the scroll bar over there just goes on forever um, that has a lot of good info on this so um, yeah so supported browsers is one of the first things and we've got info there about um, various versions of IE um, Firefox, 4 and higher, Safari, Chrome. I mean, it, it seems to be doing pretty well in most browser environments. And if you run into trouble with that, we'd love to hear where you're having problems. We recently pushed pushed a big update that should fix a bunch of, of pretty big problems that were happening in um, Internet Explorer, so hopefully that's resolved those. Um, great. So that was browsers. Then, have you tried to put ViewShare on top of a repository like DSpace, Fedora, or ePrints? Um, we have had some users use it with that. The the OAI PMH import is actually really nice with that because you can, in many cases, directly import data over. Um, and it it will, as long as it has the information about the, you know, where the actual files are located, it works just fine. Um, or even just the URLs to the objects. So you can turn this, you can point this at your, um, for example, DSpace, uh, OAI PMH um, uh, endpoint, and just sort of pull in uh, big chunks of data, and, and it works quite well. Um, and file size limit, individual files, total files. There, um, this is a good point to again reiterate that we're not actually storing copies of those images, so there's there's no uh, there there's no files to speak of so much as there is just information, uh, sort of metadata about the the objects, and there is no uh, real limit in that. You can have as many number of views or as many sets of of data that you've uploaded as possible. Those are actually really really light and small. Um, Oh, fantastic. Good idea. So, 
Sure. So I'll show the scissors actually with. So in this case, I'm, I'm showing the partners collection view. This is just off of our site. It, it's a table and a, a map um, and a timeline. And this is actually um, partners of the digital preservation program here. Um, so it's a little different than working with collections as these are organizations instead of objects. But the scissors, um, if you click on the scissors, you'll see a few different options there like um, uh, the one that that I'll mostly point people towards because you can actually pull out the pull this out as RDFXML or a few other things but the tab separated values is generally the, the easiest way to explain this and so what it's done here and it's sort of tiny and hard to see but it actually has all of the data that powers that view is now displayed right there and so to make that a little more real I'll go over to Excel um, make a new workbook and just paste it in. And so in this case, you can see the, I mean, how many, how much data is here? So there's 279 different partners in that list, and it's all of the data, including the augmented data, too. So anywhere you embed the views is actually exposing the, the sort of raw data that powers it. And I could, for example, even edit this and then upload that um, thereafter. It also, the uh, exhibit JSON, that's actually the, the sort of core way the data is represented. That's what we're, we're viewing. And so in this case, if you want to, you can see what the data structure behind this looks like. And um, it's slightly more structured than just, you know, a tab separated values export. So it's, it's useful in, in those cases. But it's neat because it's actually exposing sort of uh, some very lightweight, very minimal linked data that... Um, other folks can use to work with your collection. <laughs> yes, JSON exclamation point. Um, so there were a couple more questions that came up from that. Um, Great, we've got a, um, so I'll start at the bottom with an easy one. Um, is the scissor info available on publicly embedded views? Yes, if you if you make the data, if you if you publicly embed a view and other people can see it, any anyone can scissors the data and, and get at it too. So you, you sort of, I mean, it's another way of saying is it's actually just um, exposing data in the same way that the browser is. Um, and now there was a question in there about, um, image sizes and jp2s um so what it's yeah it's as 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 I, as we said before it's just wrapping an image tag so in many cases people's browsers probably won't be able to it, it'll depend on browser support for jp2s um so if if that's there then they'll work fine um but if you have really large images you'll run into um I mean, one, you probably don't want to be serving them up like that because you would be generating really big images. Um, and two, um, it, it'd be a sort of load problem on the, the end users. So if you could, for example, generate um, thumbnail views of all of those big files and then use links to the thumbnails instead of the big ones, you'd be in much better shape and your users would probably be happier too. Um, Okay, then there was one other question that that, that was about working with a large set with um, images where, you know, some of them do have images and some don't. Um, that's a good question. The, um, you could probably deal with that in CSS on the, um, 
or potentially deal with that in CSS on your own. If you embed it in your own site, you can always just sort of add your own CSS rules to govern it. When it, when it embeds, it's not embedding them in, um, you know, in any kind of wrapper. It really will let, it'll take on local style characteristics and you can poke around and, and do additional um, caveats to it. So for example, you might be able to set up a CSS selector that would tell it not to display if there was no, uh, you know, if there was no link associated there. Or you might, another way to get around that would be to just um, fill in the, the data for the broken, uh, the ones that don't have images, put in a default image into all of those empty slots that would say no image or something like that, just a little no sign or something. Um, it's possible to imagine ways that we could work around that in the future, but it's tricky too because you'd have to check or something like that. But that's, that, I'll make a note of that too. Great, and then um, we're we're getting towards two o'clock, and and then we've got this booked for a little longer than that. But there's probably no reason to go too much longer. I'm giving you guys sort of the crash course in using the tool, and um, we'll be sending around a survey shortly after to to sort of ask you for your feedback on the workshop, but also to ask for feedback about future development. Um, Uh, so this is the image reference question again, quick, and I'll, I'll respond to that. So if you can, if you, the, the way it works is it needs a URL. So if you have a URL for an image file that you can get out of the database, if you can generate URLs or something like that, then, then you're good to go. But otherwise it, it, it can't do them. Um, Oh, and I should also mention that the, the, the project itself is open source software. So if you do a search for, um, uh, if you go on GitHub and look at Loc Recollect, that's actually the, the, the software too. Um, on the, yeah, and, and we'd be, we'd be thrilled to have more people play around with the source code itself. Um, and so it's, it's, it's actually in a couple different places, but, um, send us emails and we'll talk more about it. Future plans, we're, um, over the next year, we're probably going to, we're going to be continuing to do a little more tweaking development, adding more things most likely. Um, but we're, uh, supporting this and really doing a lot of hopefully promoting it to get, get more users of it. Um, Oh, and there was an Omeka question that I should respond to, too. Um, we we have had an interest in exploring um, sort of live syncing with, with, or directly synchronizing with sort of um, online tools like Omeka, for example, but any number of other tools. Uh, we could actually bro more broadly support parts of the um, OAI PMH standard um, by getting updates, for example. So when new items get added there, they automatically get added over here. It becomes a little tricky, but it is something we're interested in. Um, we're very interested in, in adding, particularly if it seems like something a lot of users are interested in. And so please do uh, take time to fill out the survey that we send, which will have space in it for comments too, because we do want to know um, future directions for development. Um, but for the most part, the tool is in a stable public uh, release, and we're going to be sort of pushing it out and, and doing a lot of talking about it, getting people to use it, and then seeing um, what sort of patterns emerge in terms of what features people really want in the future. Um, yeah, it will. It will work with Atom feeds currently. Um, now you run into an issue where it's 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 not going to pull the feed. So, for example, if there was um, you know if the feed only exposes 20 items, it's going to grab the 20 items. Um, but if the feed uh, again, as as it doesn't have that sort of synchronization or or checking, or it won't you know paginate backwards in a feed. But um, in one case, I had someone that had an atom dump of, or actually that that uh, Blue Ridge collection was an atom dump of 3,700 collection or items, and I just imported the whole thing in one swoop. So if you can dump a whole giant thing as a single sort of run of atom, that'll work. But the uh, the sort of feed paginating isn't there. Um, Yeah, it, I'm, I'm seeing a question too that was about parsing a folder structure. It's not, it, it, 
it um all it does is it will it will upload it will interpret information out of a single file so it it can't really um it doesn't have any capabilities beyond that so if it's you know um if it can be sort of encoded in one XML file on the on the front end, then you can upload all that data. But that's not really part of the structure of it. But it's a, it's a good thing to think about. So we'll we'll think about that too. Thanks everybody. This is I I hope this has been useful. And yeah, as Abby mentioned, their NDIP access and make sure you get both I's and both P's. Um, and again, feel free to pass the, the or please be encouraged to pass this on. Um, if you want to demo this for other folks, I'd be, um, we'd be happy to help give you some background on it. We're really sort of inviting uh, more uh, broad use of it. And the more people we can get using that, the better off we are in terms of finding out what we should be doing and also probing the limits of, of exactly how it works and what it can and uh, should do. So again, thanks everybody, and we'll send... We'll send that survey out, and we'll put up, hopefully, a uh, video of this, too, that everyone can uh, return to, or if you want to uh, check it out again later, you can just revisit it or send the link on to other people. So, again, thank you.